Welcome to the February 8th, 2024 Contra Costa County CERT Coalition meeting. We join our presentation in progress. Our next earthquake and other things, should we worry? Yeah, okay, should we worry? So, <laughs> um, uh, this is really not going to happen during the next earthquake, but uh, this is from the movie Earthquake, a terrible movie. Uh, <laughs> unrealistic and uh, these big crevasses these big pits really don't open up dinosaurs don't jump out people don't jump in but um good movie to watch anyway on a friday night uh just something about me for those of you who don't know me um i'm a uh, geologist i'm from new york i Went to PS165 in Parson Junior High School. I graduated from Forest Hills High School. Paul Simon went there. Uh, so that's me in my high school graduation photo. Uh, the middle photo is me working on my doctorate in Guatemala. That was my uh, period of growing my hair a little longer, letting a cigarette dangle out of my lips, and uh, I carried a machete on my side. And uh, the photo at the uh, lower right is uh, me out on the Rogers Creek Fall a number of years ago. I don't look too different now, maybe maybe <laughs> a little older. Um, but uh, basically, my whole career has been in active faulting and earthquakes. I worked for Woodward Clyde Consultants for 12 years. And then the USGS for 32 and a half, retired there in October of 2017. And I'm currently a scientist emeritus so that I can uh, keep my fingers in the pot and make a general nuisance of myself. <laughs> uh, so what I'd like to do today is talk about earthquakes and faults in Contra Costa County, and then throw a number of other things on the table. We are prisoners of the plate boundary. We live along the boundary between the Pacific plate and the North American plate, and they're sliding past each other as shown by these arrows at about 40 millimeters a year. And that doesn't sound like very much, but over time it builds up. And the sliding motion puts stress onto the crust and the crust has zones of weakness, and these are faults. And when the stress overcomes the strength of the fault, it slips, it releases energy, things start to shake. And um, this red line is the general San Andreas system. We get to Northern California, and the plate motions change, and the Pacific plate here is sliding underneath North America. And this is the big Cascadia subduction zone, as it's called, where in uh, the early 1600s, there was what we think was a magnitude nine plus earthquake. And they're sitting up there now waiting for the next one to happen. Uh, if we look at the Bay Area, this is what we have. So there's 40 millimeters a year of stress. And what comes in must come out. And it comes out as slip on fault during earthquakes. It comes out as after slip. So after the earthquake, the fault continues to move. Uh, it comes out as creep. Some faults like the Hayward are moving all the time. And if you walk along them, you'll see where curbs have been affected, where buildings have been affected. And um, there's also faults that never make it to the surface. And these are called blind faults. And we have blind faults in Contra Costa County too. Mount Diablo, which is uh, right out in front of my house, is not a volcano, as <laughs> some people think. It's a fold. It's a piece of crust caught between two falls, the Greenville and the Concord. It's being pushed together. It's being pushed up. 
and there's a big blind fault underneath. And I'll make talk about that in a little bit. I just want to ask, is my sound okay? Yes, you sound great. Okay, all right. So this is the fault map of our general area uh, with the San Gregorio, the San Andreas, the Hayward, the Calaveras, the Greenville, Mount Diablo sits in here, the Concord Green Valley, the West Napa, the Rogers Creek, and there are faults on to the south. All right, 1906, 5.12 a.m., April 18th, the longest rupture uh, in continental crust. That's the kind of crust we have uh, in, in California, historically, 470 kilometers long. It was felt, the earthquake was felt from Ar Oregon down to LA and into Nevada and probably felt a lot further. And there were uh, a little more than 3,000 fatalities. So San Francisco burning. And we'll come back to this. And this is what the fault looked like on the ground. It's not a huge gaping hole like is shown in the, the movie Earthquake. It's a really, really narrow zone that you can walk along and jump across. It won't bite you. And uh, just another example of that, in 2002, there was a magnitude 7.9 on the Denali Fault in Alaska. And uh, this is a shot I took from a helicopter. And here is the rupture. And if you look at this little stream, it comes down to here. It's now been moved over here, five meters or 15 feet. And this type of fault is the predominant fault that we have in Contra Costa County. Um, I just thought I would throw this on. If you were living here in 1906, um, uh, this is the way people describe the 1906 earthquake. Uh, the most severe earthquake ever experienced in the San Ramon Valley occurred at a quarter after five o'clock yesterday morning. It lasted some two minutes and was followed by light shocks throughout the morning. There was scarcely a chimney left throughout our valley and there were many narrow escapes. But as far as learned, no one was injured. Great excitement prevailed. Now today, with the way things are built up, a magnitude 7.9 on the San Andreas Fault would have different results, and other faults closer in will definitely have different results. And uh, normal life came to a standstill. John Moss of Alamo had business in San Francisco, but instead the family went to Oakland and watched the fire. So it was kind of a good time for all. Um, uh, and then I can't read all of what I have on the lower part of the slide, but uh, in the San Ramon Valley, there were uh, organizations that donated to the, to the earthquake relief. So that's what happened out in Central Costa, Contra Costa County in 1906. It would be a lot different today. So I'd like to say something about recent seismicity, the characteristics of the major faults we're dealing with, the magnitudes and probabilities, old and new. And this is a map, uh, which I'll come back to. Uh, the little black dots show earthquakes. And these are between 1984 and 2002. I didn't have a chance to update this, but it's fundamentally the same. Nothing very much would change. And the uh, red dots show historical events of magnitude five and larger. Uh, 1957 on the Greenville, 1861 on the Calaveras, uh, 1986 Mount Lewis. Really interesting feature. And then up on top, which I can't read, um, tell me what date it says. 1954, 5.5. 5. 
5.5, okay. Got it. So these are the these are the these are the largest earthquakes that have occurred historically in Contra Costa County, and they're not really very large. I mean, uh, mostly high fives and uh, about a six. And here's a map just showing all the faults. And uh, this is like you have a bad dream, and you get up and you look at the ceiling. And certainly, suddenly all of these lines are all over the place. And uh, the different colors just represent when the fault last moved. The uh, most important are the faults in yellow and orange. They are the youngest. And then red is historical, like the San Andreas in 1906. So, um, if you think you're having a nightmare, no, you're just looking at a fault map of Contra Costa County. Um, there was a large earthquake in 1861. This is the San, San Ramon Valley. This is the Calaveras Fault. Uh, and the Calaveras Fault is one of the largest faults we have. Uh, so in 1861, there was a damaging earthquake. Uh, and then we believe from our work that in 1740, there was an even larger earthquake extending to the south. And at a place called Leiden Creek, there's evidence of five ruptures in the past 2,500 years. So these faults have been active. They have been moving. They just don't produce magnitude fives. I don't know how many people were around in 1980. The Greenville Fault had an earthquake. Actually, it had two, a 5.8 and a 5.5. Here is the Greenville Fault. The rupture is in red. This is Mount Diablo. This is the, the uh, Concord Fault. So you can see Mount Diablo is caught between these two faults. And then there was another fault called the Las Positas, which movement and stress change on the Greenville actually triggered. And I'll mention something about triggered earthquakes later. 1980, the wine industry was just getting going in Livermore Valley. Uh, some wine was lost, unfortunately. Today, it would be a much larger economic loss because Livermore Valley has come really, really far, uh, far along. Uh, and then we have Mount Diablo itself. So this is a view out of my front door. And Mount Diablo is this fold, big fold in the Earth's crust. And underneath it is this feature. This is a thrust fault where this side moves up over this, but it's blind because it doesn't come to the surface. And we've had, in California, we've had historically blind ruptures Colinga, you may remember in 83, that was a 6-7. Woody and Narrows in Southern California, a 5-9. Loma Prieta was on a blind fault. It was not the San Andreas, although it was close to the San Andreas. And Northridge, we just celebrated the 20th anniversary of that. Blind fault. And then Winters Vacaville, if we go back, 1892 two earthquakes on blind thrust faults. Now, for me, the fault, I'm sandwiched between the Calaveras fault and the Mount Diablo blind thrust. So I'm going to get it one way or another. But the blind thrust fault is probably our biggest hazard in Contra Costa County. And here's another view looking at Mount Diablo with the associated faults and the blind thrust is here it's underneath the fault is moving in this direction and this will cause an event very similar to the northridge earthquake and if you're really interested in mount diablo and want to be a little scientific uh, about a year and a half ago the geological society of america published this volume Regional Geology of Mount Diablo, California, its tectonic evolution on the North American plate boundary. 
and that sounds pretty technical. And the volume is pretty technical. There are some uh, easier papers to read on the history of Mount Diablo. And I was supposed to write a paper for this, but I was too lazy to write the paper. But if you look at the editorship down at the bottom, I was one of the editors and uh, we really, really put out a very, very nice piece of work. So this is available from the Geological Society of America. Um, okay. I want to see what I wanted to point out. Ah, of course. The Concord Fault. So the Concord Fault is here. The Concord Fault is probably the most urbanized fault in Contra Costa County. If you were flying above it, you'd see this. This is a lagoon. Houses are built all around it, apartment houses. And this is actually a step in the Concord Fault where it's pulled the crust apart, made this little hole, which is filled with water for a beautiful lake. But what what's underlying that lake is a fault that's capable of producing a large earthquake. And uh, you can go to Concord and you can say to people, ah, oh, you know where the Concord fault is? You could stop this guy in his car and say, hold on, man. Do you know where the Concord fault is? And what he's doing, he's driving over it. This step in Market Street is the Concord fault. And if you go to Willow Pass, there's this large step in Willow Pass. This is the Concord Fault. So the Concord is a big active fault, probably capable of producing a seven, even though historically it hasn't. And um, here's Mount Diablo. Again, with the Calaveras Fault right here. A lot of things are going on in the San Ramon Valley. Um, one of them being swarms. And uh, I can't see hands raised, but I imagine all of you have experienced the San Ramon Valley swarms. Uh, these started in 19, or were first really recognized in around 1970. And I'm sure they've been going on a lot longer. And the swarm is an energetic sequence of small earthquakes occurring in, in an area over days, weeks, and months. It dif differs from a typical earthquake sequence that has a main shock followed by smaller aftershocks. And in swarms, the largest event, excuse me, can occur any time during the sequence. And if you look behind the writing, here's a guy fighting off a swarm of bees. So... Now, these are the San Ramon Valley swarms. The different colored uh, dots are earthquakes. Uh, the numbers show the year of the swarm, the largest earthquake in the swarm, the number of earthquakes in the swarm, and the duration. The largest was this in 1990. It occurred near the end of the Calaveras Fault. We were really concerned that it might actually set off the Calaveras Fault. It went through Round Hill Country Club. It knocked down chimneys. It lasted for 42 days. There were 351 earthquakes. The largest was a 4.4. And um, there aren't any other areas like this in the Bay Area. So uh, we have a unique set of faults, and um, it's been quiet for a while. Here again are the swarms with the dates. And the most recent was in 2018. So this is my house in Danville, and these were earthquakes that occurred very close to my house. Needless to say, I was very excited. My wife was under the bed half of the time, <laughs> and uh, my grandkids didn't want to come and visit us. Um, 
So this basically is a, is a fault that is trying to extend itself from the Calaveras to the Concord Green Valley. So when, where, and how large will the next ones be? Uh, there are always committees formed. Uh, the caption says, thank God, a panel of experts. This is me crawling up to the panel. And we've had official probabilities uh, each of these years. Um, and the initial one, well, I'll start with uh, in two, two of between, let me just see where I am. Okay. This is the initial one, 62% in 30 years. And yeah, we picked 30 years uh, because at the time we did this, 30 years was the length of an average mortgage. People could relate to that. Uh, 30 years was a good period of time for engineers to think about building new structures. And it sort of stuck. And um, uh, more than 30 years have passed since the first study was done. And people keep saying, okay, when's the big one coming? All right. Here was another one. Uh, this was the USURF 2. And, and uh, this study was done in 2007. And it came up with a probability of 63%. Not very different. And what I want to also point out is the uncertainty in these, in these probabilities. So there's a number to talk about but the uncertainty is very large. The probability might be much lower. It might be much higher. And then in 2014, another study was done and the probability was raised to, I can't read what it says on my slide, tell me. Uh, probably 72%. Okay, that sounds good. And here's the uncertainty. <laughs> um, and we added additional faults into the pot. and uh, But the type of probability was changed. And I'm not going to go into that. I barely understand it. And I will not make you be able to understand it. But the number was high for a large earthquake, six, seven or larger, somewhere in this region, in this fault system. And if we take a look back, we see something very interesting that here we are, uh, 1906, this should be a 7.9, 7.8 still big. And the blue circles represent historical earthquakes. Most of this comes from work by a seismologist, Bill Bakken, and based on newspaper reports, he developed a, uh, an algorithm for estimating the magnitude of these earthquakes. And you'll see all of these magnitude fives and sixes. And then 1906 happened. And then look after 1906, it got very, very quiet. And there were a few fives, high fives, a couple of sixes. The largest was six nine, Loma Prieta. And so we've gone into a period of quiescence um, since 1906. We've had 16 earthquakes of five or larger in the greater uh, Bay Area um, in 113 years. Uh, before 1906, we had 39 in a 56 year period before 1906. And we can see the same thing in the geological studies we've done, where we've put trenches across the falls. We've been able to date the timing of the most recent event with radiocarbon. And you can see there was a period with very large earthquakes back in the 1700s and late 1600s, and then 1906 and general quiescence. But the plates are moving, and they're moving at 40 millimeters a year. And all of these faults have to catch up. 
they all have to move. So very recently, uh, a new uh, hazard study came out uh, as part of the new seismic hazard map for the US on which to uh, base building codes. And this area in red shows the highest probability of an earthquake in California. Uh, and again, I can't read the top. Is, is that 90%? 90%. 90. Yeah. So living anywhere in this area, there's a 90% <laughs> chance uh, in 30 years that you will experience experience a damaging earthquake. So we can't get away from them. Uh, but we, there is some reason to be optimistic. And 1989 was a, uh, it was a catalyst for earthquake work in the Bay Area. Before that, everything went to Southern California. Southern California was a place where all of these big earthquakes had occurred, and that's where the money went, that's where the research was being done, and Loma Prieta really changed that. It put money back into the Bay Area, it put research back into the Bay Area, it put engineering back into the Bay Area, and all of the infrastructure people, uh, PG&E, you may not believe that with the recent blackouts we've been having, but PG&E, East Bay Mud, Santa Clara Valley Water, BART, all have made major changes to deal with the future earthquakes. And uh, I just want to show you one example of engineering that works. And this is the Trans-Alaska Pipeline. And I have a warm spot in my heart for this because my first summer job, which turned into a 12-year consulting job, which turned into the USGS, started with working on the fault study for the Trans-Alaska Pipeline. And this is the pipe. These are special supports that take the heat, heat from the pipe and radiate it out and they cool the permafrost underneath. And this is the special zone that was built for the Denali Fault to cross it. It's on metal sliders. Uh, it has Teflon shoes, which allow the pipe to move back and forth. It was a unique engineering design. And this is the group that did the fault study. I always thought this photo could have been the cover of a early 1970s folk rock album. Um, Lloyd Clough from Woodward Clyde was in charge. Bert Slemons from Nevada, Reno uh, was his second in command. This is a great group of geologists. And this guy in the purple jacket, dark beard, long dark hair, New York City kid, that's me. Um, and uh, we tried to figure out where the Denali crossed the pipeline route. In the end, uh, the pipeline was designed for 30 feet or 9.1 meters. That was recommended by the consultants. Lloyd and uh, other people. Alias, who the pipeline company designed for 20 feet of movement. And in 2002, the rupture was 5.8 meters of right lateral, like the San Andreas that Alias could design for 6.1, and uh, 1.6 meters of vertical. And this is what it looked like, this was the pipeline before. Here we go. Here are the steel sliders and the Teflon shoes. And then this is the pipeline after the earthquake. Here's the Denali fault. It bent, but it didn't break. If it had been buried, it would have broken. There would have been black oil on white snow. So this is a very successful design. And I hated the pipeline when I first worked on it. I hated Alieska. I hated these big companies. But I'll have to tell you, going up there now and flying over the pipeline, uh, it's, it's almost like a piece of art. And uh, they were worried about uh, 
animal migrations, caribou, no problem. They went under it, they jumped over it. So it's been a very, very successful uh, en engineered structure. And so let's go, is that, that a question? I don't okay. think, so. I think it's a little background noise. We'll have questions for you, definitely. <laughs> okay, so let's let's just go back. I'm finishing up. Let's go back to uh, uh, Contra Costa County, uh, our earthquakes again, historically have been on the moderate side, but that won't always be the case. Even a moderate earthquake, uh, most of you probably remember 2014, the Napa earthquake that uh, caused almost uh, three quarters of a billion dollars in damage. Uh, it was on a fault that ruptured for about 25 kilometers. Uh, it was a magnitude six. It was our type earthquake in Contra Costa County. And I have to say, if you've been to Napa recently, and I would recommend it, my wife and I just spent a night at the New Archer Hotel in downtown. Very, very nice. Napa really got a lot of funds after the earthquake and they rebuilt, uh, they uh, strengthened their buildings. And now every other store is either women's shoes or wine tasting. So you can go up there, you can walk it. It's, it's a lovely place. And, um, uh, but this is the type of earthquake we will probably get in Contra Costa County again but we could get larger. Um, just recently, uh, there were two earthquakes in Turkey, in Turkey, that also affected Syria. And uh, this was a doublet. It was unusual. There was a magnitude 7.8. This is the East Anatolia Fault. This is the North Anatolia Fault. This is Africa sliding into Turkey, just like the Pacific sliding into North America. And Turkey is being squeezed out to the West on all of these different, different faults. Um, but what I want to point out here is there was a 7-8 followed nine hours later by a seven five. So two hugely strong earthquakes. It left more than 50,000 fatalities. Uh, it really heavily damaged uh, this area, even though they had modern building codes, a lot of graph, some of the buildings were not built the way they should have been. But these doublets can happen. And so one of the things that's not in our building codes is the possibility of having one large earthquake followed in a short period of time by another damaging large earthquake. And sometime down the road, if I get invited back, I could give a nice talk on all of these doublets and odd things that occur with earthquakes. Now, the top is uh, San Francisco burning in 1906. The bottom is uh, San Francisco being washed away during our most recent uh, atmospheric river attack on, on the Bay Area. So now we have to not only worry about earthquakes, we have climate, climate change. So there is a relationship between earthquakes and climate change. So I just want to make things a little bit more... Um, worrisome. Climate change does not cause earthquakes, but the effects of climate change can exacerbate, exacerbate the effects of earthquakes. So if things are drier, it's easier for fires to spread. And almost every earthquake causes some sort of ignition. Uh, you can see really bad results like 1906, or the 1927 Kanto earthquake in Japan. Um, fire is potentially a very, very big deal 
if things are dry and there is the right fuel and there's not the water to fight the fire. Climate change also makes things wetter and that leads to more landslides and mud flows when they're shaking. And sea level is rising and this in coastal areas raises the groundwater level and widens the area where there's higher groundwater. And this can lead to more widespread liquefaction when there's a large earthquake. So we might have at some point uh, a double whammy of an atmospheric river plus an earthquake together. And you can just imagine what that will do to the population. How do we respond? So earthquakes will happen. And I think this is re <coughs> really important, especially for CERT. And that's getting people, helping people to prepare. Um, I have to say that our power went out here in Danville at about 10 to 6. Uh, I did have two large lanterns run by batteries that I could use for lighting. We do have a gas stovetop, but I had to hunt for matches to get it on, uh, to boil my water and make a nice, nice pasta. But if you're, we have a large earthquake, your power may be out for a week. It may be out for two weeks. That's a real problem. Food spoils. So you have to have some sort of supply, canned food, freeze-dried food um, available to cook. And then you need a stove. So some sort of propane stove to be able to cook your food, heat your food on. Your home lighting is out. Your internet is out. Uh, any non-hardwired phones are out. Get crank up radios. Um, we actually have in my house, most of our wall phones run off the internet. And so they were out. We have one hardwired connection left from AT&T that we can plug in and call in and out, unless that goes out too. Have solar charges, propane stove, even your grill outside. Um, you can cook on that. Plenty of batteries, flashlights, and other types of emergency lighting. You can buy what look like regular bulbs, and they have batteries in the bottom. And you can screw them into your normal sockets and have lights throughout your house. Have gas in your cars. The gas pumps are electric. They're not going to work. You're not going to get very far. If you have an electric vehicle, vehicle, your SOL, have cash. The ATM machines are not going to be working. And medications, CVS, as long as it stays in business, is not going to be open. You're not going to be able to go and get your medications. So have a supply that's going to last you for a while. And don't forget water. I think I think these are really critical, and I find that even someone like myself, who's aware of this, you become just kind of eh, laissez-faire. You go on with life, and um, you just don't develop what you really need um, for a long-term outage. And this all presupposes your house is fine and you can live in it. So these are things you can do to prepare. I think this is at the end, the really important story. We are an earthquake country. We will have earthquakes of various size, sizes in the future, maybe tonight, maybe 10 years from now, they will happen. You have to be prepared. And so with that, I say thank you. Bye. Yeah. Um, okay. Hi, David. Uh, I have a question. Thank, first of all, thank you for this presentation. It was very insightful and, and very I learned a couple of things about uh, some of the fault lines that had been missing prior. But if I'm correct, I thought I heard you say that the Concord fault or, you know, faults in, the, in Concord were the most urbanized, most dangerous in the county. And I'm under the impression that the Hayward fault, we, particularly the northern fault would be the most urbanized and particularly the most dangerous with some of the infrastructure that would be oh, it, involved. It, 
in in Contra Costa County, it's it, the Concrete Fault is the most urbanized. In the Bay Area, the Hayward Fault is the most urbanized. I mean, uh, I think they have counted something like 475 structures that sit directly on the Hayward Fault itself. So the Hayward Fault is the most heavily urbanized fault maybe maybe in the world. Um, but in terms of Contra Costa County, the, the Concord Fault goes through Concord and it's the most heavily urbanized fault in the county. Does the Hayward not run through the Costa Costa County? Just this uh, The Hayward, well, yes, the Hayward gets into Contra Costa on the other side of other side of the East Bay Hills. Yeah, about so, three hundred thousand yeah. people. What? About three hundred thousand people. That that that's in West West Costa Costa County. Yeah. So I was thinking I was thinking more of uh, our side of the East Bay Hills, but you're you're definitely correct. Yeah, there's um, been a lot of people on on, on the other side of the hill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, you can edit that out of my talk <laughs> and something else. <laughs> okay. Well, well, thank you very much. Awesome. Any other questions for David? Thank you so much, David. It's always so great to have you. Obviously missed you. <laughs> Any other questions for him? Don't be shy. Yeah, anything. And you think about presenting this stuff, anything that um, comes up to Margaret, go. Yeah. So I'm kind of curious. I know you said that East Bay Mud has done some improvements. Do you feel or do you have any knowledge of, of how long our water systems might be out if we experience one of those large events? Do you have confidence that it won't be months, that it, it won't be up to a month, that it might be less? Yeah, I think I think with the water system, um, the East Bay Mud along with Santa Clara Valley Water have made improvements in the types of pipes they're using for the main distri distribution systems. I think there are still problems with the smaller distribution system coming to our houses. So if you're in a neighborhood that's really been strongly shaken and your water pipes burst, I don't know how long it will be by the time they get to you to repair those. So yes, in parts of the Bay Area, water could be out for a significant amount of time. But they've gotten much better at being able to fight fires. Um, and you know, in 1906, there was a, there were there was water, but it was not usable. Uh, in 1989, they had to bring in fireboats to fight the fire uh, you know, up in the northern part of the city. So fire following earthquake is an issue. In terms of drinking water, we're probably much further along than we were pre-1989. And then how similarly, how are you feeling about the, the large gas pipelines running throughout our urban communities? Well, again, I think PG&E will tell you that uh, with their gas pipelines, they've, uh, they've done retrofitting, uh, they've made improvements, uh, I can't tell you exactly what those improvements are, and you can touch base with PG&E and see if you get a straight answer. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, yeah, everything has basically been upgraded. It doesn't mean that it's going to be perfect when we have the next large earthquake. But if we hadn't had 1989, it wouldn't have been that wake-up call. And it's the same is true for the science. When I first joined the survey, they said, oh, great. Um, we're sending you to Southern California to work on the Southern San Andreas. That was the, you know, that was the big thing. Um, we've done so much since Loma Prieta on increasing our knowledge of 
Bay Area Falls, their history, their potential for rupture in the future. Uh, and uh, again, we'd still be in the semi-dark ages, I think, if it wasn't for Loma Prieta. And, and how do you feel about downtown San Francisco and all of that, you know, newer construction? And uh, do, do you go to, down, the, spend time in the financial district lingering? <laughs> um, you know, I, I really think that the earthquake engineering community um, has probably done a pretty good job. And those high rise buildings are good. There was a lot learned from Northridge uh, about uh new reconstruction and so all of these lessons have been incorporated uh i'm more concerned about the building maybe sinking and tilting because the foundation wasn't put into bedrock like the millennial tower and if they ever get that straight i don't know uh <laughs> but uh and i guess that's why joe montana moved out of there but I think that I think the earthquake engineers are really good. And so all of those high rises, uh, office buildings, office, um, you know, condo buildings, I think they're pretty safe. Now, you really may shake like hell up on top, <laughs> but uh, it's not going to topple over. Thank you. And Richard, did you have a question? I know your hand was up and then. Yes, I did. Thank you, Danielle. And thank you again, David, for uh, excellent presentation. Uh, and I'm sure this question has been asked many times, but I'm just so that you all know, I'm new to this jurisdiction in West Contra Costa County. So coming into this role, overseeing uh, Richmond, you know, we have refineries as our neighbors, you know, Chevron and also all the ones positioned in the northern part along the coast. My question, David, is based on you know, the book, interesting picture you showed there in terms of the earthquake retrofitting that was done on the uh, Trans-Alaskan uh, pipeline. I'm just curious to know, and, and I think as you mentioned, well, uh, for uh, PG&E, uh, curious to know as to how much is, is have you known about uh, gas pipeline retrofitting? I know that's my homework to investigate as well in, in, in partnership with the refineries, but from your research perspective, what can be what can we be assured of regarding the the the, the actual uh, petroleum pipelines and the retrofitting? Yeah, I, that's a good question. I don't know where they are they are located. Actually, I don't know how many important pipelines may cross active faults. Um, I don't know how many pipelines sit in relatively safe areas and you know all of that information is hopefully available for pg and &E. but you brought up something that i've always been concerned about and that's the refineries and how they're going to respond and they've been in the news for you know toxic releases recently um every time i drove drive up to my son's house in venetia I go past the refineries and I look at those cracking towers and I say, uh, I don't want to see an earthquake here. You know, they sit right by the Concord Fault on one side and the other side is the Hayward Fault in Contra Costa County. Um, and I don't know what kind of earthquake engineering has gone into those, those cracking towers. Uh, it's very secretive. Um, I know a good friend of mine um, who works for Channel Channel 5, uh, Brian Hackney, once tried to get in there to do a report on the refineries and what they were doing for earthquake safety. And they just said, we're earthquake safe. You can't come in. So I think, uh, I think there's a lot more that the oil companies uh, should be sharing with the public about the uh, vulnerability of their facilities to large ground movement. Um, and uh, yeah, why don't you research that? <laughs> yeah, like I said, it's a huge homework for me. We're just, just curious to see, <laughs> to know what, what, what you had in mind, but thank you. Awesome. 
any other questions for David so we can let him go and enjoy his view of Mount Diablo that's been created by Lark. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, David, for coming on and giving your presentation. So helpful. My pleasure.